only a very small percentage of the 100 trillion tests that we could run are going to expose this bug. 10 Fs in a row is going to be rare. 10 Fs in a row after B, even rarer. Do you think you would ever create a test that repeated F 10 times without passing B? When I teach this example in a live classroom, most students say no. That includes most professional testers. So if you said no, this test is too extreme, too specific, no one would ever run this case in practice, it's a dumb case to run, you're in good company. So this is a good time to remember our rule about extreme cases. No one would do that doesn't really mean no one would do that. It means no one who I can currently think of would do that for any reason that I can currently imagine. Testing is a humbling experience because it shows us time and again how limited our imaginations really are. In the real world, we actually did find exactly this bug. Here's the Telenova One telephone system. I was one of its programmers. A person using our phone could put up to 10 people on hold at once. Every call had a fair bit of data associated with it. So when a user put a call on hold, we put the call's data structure on a stack. The phone displayed a list of calls on hold, and you could decide which call to connect to. Just press the button. One of our beta sites was a stockbroker. In those days, stockbrokers were like the Olympic athletes of telephone users. You'd visit a broker and you'd see this desk full of telephones. He'd set up trades over the phone and he'd have multiple calls going so that he could work on one deal while he was waiting on the other. The brokers loved our system because instead of juggling handsets with one on this shoulder and one on that shoulder and different colors of tape on the phones, we had one phone that could juggle 10 calls. Put on one headset, you could work all day without having to strain your neck and upper back while you were trying to write while you were working on the phone. Unfortunately, on busy days, sometimes one of our phones would crash. Then other phones would crash. This could go on for an hour or longer. They'd lose a huge amount of business. We finally figured out the problem. Let me show it with a simplified state diagram. You could have up to 10 calls on hold. Now, most phones are usually at idle. Someone calls, your phone rings, and you either pick it up, which puts your phone into a connected state, or you don't pick it up, and then eventually the caller hangs up and your phone goes back to idle. Once you're connected, you can talk for a while and then hang up go back to idle, or the caller can hang up, or you can put the caller on hold. When you take a call off of hold, we take the held calls data off the stack and we put it in the current call record. Suppose you put a call on hold, but before you reconnect, the caller hangs up. Those of you who are fairly young are probably used to that, but in the early 1980s, the norm in customer service centers was that 90% of callers were taken off hold within two minutes. Not many people hung up while they were on hold, we didn't specifically think about it when writing the code. Well, we handled the case pretty well. When the caller hung up, we took their name off the display. We marked the outside line that they called in on as available. We freed up the time slice that was allocated to the call. Everything looked as though the call was gone, but the call record stayed on the stack. It was inaccessible, but it wasn't actually deleted. So the stack could fill up. You'd think we would have noticed this problem right away. Our testers work with 10 held calls all the time. And they did the caller hangs up thing plenty of times, and they never saw a problem. It's because the problem was more subtle. Originally, our code checked the stack every time we added or removed anything. This would have caught this bug. But this took so much system time that we had to pull it out. By then, we were confident that the handling of the call waiting and hold stacks worked. So we expected never to see a stack problem. But just in case a bug was introduced later, we made the stack bigger big enough for 20 call records even though the system would have at most 10 held calls. So if garbage ever got on the stack, we still had room for the real calls. Then we added a stack reset command to a few places. Anywhere where we knew the stack was supposed to be empty, we had a reset. We didn't have time to check what was on the stack, but we had time to clear it. This made sure that if there ever was garbage on the stack, it got cleared off quickly. None of this should have been necessary because the whole stack worked, but we put it in just in case. Because in defensive programming, you anticipate the possibility that someone will put a bug in the code later, and you want to automatically detect that future failure if it happens and recover from it. In fact, sometime over the next year, one of us made the bug, and this defensive code made that bug harmless and invisible for almost everyone. The bug put us into a situation that looks just like our diagram from Myers. If you hit F, another record worth of garbage goes on the stack. If you get to B, the garbage gets cleared up. There's only a problem if you have so many hang-ups on hold before getting to B that the total of hang-up calls and real calls on hold exceeds 20. Then you overflow the stack and crash the phone. When a phone stack overflows, on its way to rebooting, it transfers its held calls, the real held calls, to some other phones. This is called hold forwarding. 
You've probably been hold forwarded. You call someone, you wait a long time, then you hear a click and maybe the music on hold changes, and someone else answers the phone and says, who are you and what do you want? So when phone one crashes, it hold forwards its held calls to phone two. And if it fills up phone two's stack, it takes the rest and forwards them to phone three. Phone two has a full stack. The next time there's a held call, that's the end of phone two. So now it's gonna hold forward to phone three, crash that one, and to phone four. And then when phone three is going down, it hits phone four as well. Well, eventually, two minutes later, phone one finally comes back into service. It finishes its reboot cycle. And so everybody dumps their calls onto phone one, refills its stack, and sets it up to crash again soon. This is called a rotating outage. In a rotating outage, error handling from one subsystem triggers a failure in the next, and the next, and the next, until finally it comes back to the first one and takes it out again, triggering the whole sequence. In our system, the outage finally clears when the pace of call slows enough to let the phones get to idle every now and again. But during really busy times, that won't happen for hours. We were really lucky with this bug. All it did was cost a beta site some money. Things could have been much worse. Once we understood the bug, we walked through realistic scenarios under which this rotating outage in our system would have prevented potential customers of ours from giving help under life critical circumstances. In retrospect, we were lucky that this bug hadn't killed anyone. I want to tie this back to coverage. I've talked about this bug in a lot of meetings, and every now and again, some pompous fool stands up and tells me that we must not have achieved full statement or branch coverage, because if we had, we would have found this bug. Well, actually, we did achieve full statement and branch coverage of the code, but that doesn't matter. Remember our walkthrough of the Myers diagram. Hitting every line and every branch, in this case, wouldn't expose the bug. I did test abandoned held calls. With my debugger running, I'd put a call on hold, hang up the held call, and look at the stack. Problem is, even though the stack got corrupted, it got reset by the error handler so fast that I never noticed it. I never imagined that I might need to abandon several held calls in a row before getting back to idle, so I never ran that test. This is an example of a long sequence bug. Long sequence bugs are failures that show up only after a long series of events. Ultimately, Telenova built a simulator for long sequence testing. It had impressive results. A lot of the problems that people think of as irreproducible are probably long sequence. But the thing to notice here is that you're not going to see those with coverage-oriented testing. You're not going to see those with simple error-oriented testing. Long sequence bugs take a lot of work to find. Let's sum up. Testers are asked to do a lot of different tasks. Along with testing, they're expected to troubleshoot bugs, write great failure reports, document their tests, participate in code reviews, write status reports, create test tools, help support staff figure out how to work around problems, review user documentation, review advertising material, and so on. But if the basic testing time required is infinite, that doesn't leave much time for all these other activities. Any time you spend on one activity, you can't spend it on the others. It's really easy to say that testers should always fully document every test, but the real life decision is much more complex because the documentation time takes time away from code inspections, from bug report writing, test execution, and all these other worthy activities. So it's not whether you should do the documentation, it's what you're not gonna do if you do it. In the face of an infinite set of tasks, statements that testers always have to do this or always have to do that are patently unreasonable. Every task is subject to a trade-off. What's the value of this task compared to the values of all of the other tasks that could be done in that time instead? Standards that have mandatory things that testers have to do are unreasonable. You might try to solve these trade-offs by hiring more testers. That's great. But in the face of an infinitely large set of testing tasks, you can hire all the testers you want. You can spend all the money you want. It's still infinite. You're gonna run out of testers before you run out of tests, let alone run out of time to document all those tests. This is probably the hardest problem in software testing. You have to make trade-offs between things that you need to do because you can't do them all.